Washington Journal continues. John Wellinghoff is the former chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. He's joining us from San Francisco this morning to talk about a Wall Street Journal front page story last week, Mystery Assault on the Power Grid. Chairman Wellinghoff, what happened on April 16th, 2013? Uh, good morning, Greta. Uh, what happened was basically a team of individuals went into first a number of cable vaults, a number of hundreds of yards outside of a high voltage transmission substation, cut the fiber optic cables from the 911 traffic there, then moved outside of those cable vaults and moved into a pasture adjacent to the substation, set up firing positions and fired approximately 120 rounds from AK-47 style weapons into that substation and knocked out 17 transformers. Who was involved? Well, we don't know. The FBI is continuing to investigate. The only evidence that was left uh, were 120 shell casings, brasses, that had no fingerprints or no DNA. So there was virtually no evidence of uh, these individuals. There were some uh, video frames from uh, cameras that uh, the utility had that were extremely grainy. You can, you can see the firing from the AK-47s and some of the bullets actually hitting the chain link fence as they go through, but you can't certainly make out any of the figures or see exactly who they are. You could also see that there was uh, apparently a leader of the group who was uh, signaling them to commence firing with a flashlight and uh, then he, uh, he or she signaled to stop firing 19 minutes later, uh, right before the police arrived. The police arrived and uh, apparently these individuals stopped firing and left that area 70 seconds before the police arrived. Was this an act of terrorism? Well, it was certainly a purposeful act. We know that. And we know also it was an act by a group of individuals who were dedicated to destroy or severely disrupt one of our most important and most vital areas of our electric grid, these high voltage substations, and that they also put together a very, very professional plan and they executed it in a very, very professional manner. So we know ultimately that these individuals were not, for example, you know, a random group of uh, people who were, uh, you know, that night out for, to, to have some fun. It was somebody who had the intent to go into this facility and do exactly what they did. They had specific targets that they shot at and they, they avoided other targets that would have caused uh, immediate attention to what they were doing. So, that, and so they knew exactly what they were doing and they carried it out in a very professional manner. This incident has been brought up during congressional hearings with the current uh, chairman of the, of the commission. And in those hearings, it's been talked about how details should not be disclosed because it's an ongoing investigation. Why are you talking about this now? Well, I'm talking about it because I think it's important for uh, both the administration and Congress to understand how uh, vital these individual transmission system assets are to this country and how important it is for us to put together an organized plan to put in place mitigation measures to protect against these type of attacks. Let's break that down. Why are these uh, grids valuable? Well, they're valuable because we all depend upon electricity. Ultimately, every system in this country is dependent upon the electric system. So as such, if in fact there was an organized, coordinated attack on a number of these substations, it could take down very large portions of our electric grid. And if that attack was conducted in such a way that it actually destroyed the vital pieces of those substations, that is the transformers, we could be without power for a very, very long time. And what would be the economic impact of that? Oh, it would be trillions of dollars. How do we know that? How do we know that? Because our entire economy, uh, our entire society depends upon the uh, electricity continuing to uh, fuel all of our systems uh, in this country. We, we, we would not have any uh, commerce 
whatsoever. We wouldn't have any transportation because you couldn't pump gasoline. Uh, you know, we, we would be in complete chaos. I'm sure we've all seen the TV shows where um, the uh, grid goes out. Well, that's where we would be if there was a coordinated attack on these critical nodes, uh, high voltage trans, uh, transformers in the country. Why is there no plan to deal with such a sophisticated attack? Well, because there's no specific agency who's been given that authority. There are agencies, and my former agency, FERC, was one who had the authority to deal with the general reliability of the grid on a long-term basis, but no one has been given the authority to look at what they call known uh, vulnerabilities and uh, hazards and vulnerabilities, no, and ultimately, uh, in the short term, uh, ultimately, we need to assign some agency, some responsibility to put together a comprehensive coordinated plan. This was part of a number of proposed pieces of legislation over 2006, 2007, 2008. I testified multiple times uh, on this issue of known threats and vulnerabilities uh, before Congress asking uh, for the authority to be given to somebody, either FERC or some other agency. I really didn't care which agency be that would be given that authority, but uh, there was no uh, movement, unfortunately, on that legislation. So uh, there's no one to coordinate this. The individual utilities, um, you know, have other priorities, and, and, and it's not really an individual utility problem. It is, in fact, a national problem, because if we had blackouts in large portions of the country, it would affect us nationally. Where is the resistance coming from? Is it the companies? Is it Congress? And why? Well, I think it's a legacy of the fact of, of a number of, of industries, you know, not wanting more regulation, and that's certainly understandable. But I think this raises to the level that we need to uh, have some kind of a coordinated effort uh, at a federal agency level. It is not certainly a state problem. It's not certainly a utility problem because there are a number of these substations that are owned by discrete utilities, yes, but hardening them and reducing them, the, the vulnerability to these physical attacks will help everybody, will help you know all the neighboring utilities, will help all the uh, customers that are outside of those utility areas because they will be protected from uh, these types of attacks and the resultant blackouts as well. So it's something that the cost should be spread to everybody and perhaps we need some, some tax incentives. Maybe there's some other way to approach this other than a regulatory one, uh, you know, and I'm exploring those with a number of, of individuals. Uh, but ultimately there needs to be some coordinated plan to start protecting these substations. Now that we know that there are individuals who have the capability to carry out an attack as sophisticated as this one we saw on April 16th. I want you to respond to a column that was written in the Wall Street Journal yesterday by Holman Jenkins, who says there is nothing new about Americans shooting up the grid, that this has been happening for a long time. And he says this, that if the implication is that more attacks can be expected, they surely can because they've been happening for decades. One expert suggested if the assault were widely replicated around the country, it could take down the grid. He says, well, yes, it, but it would require an army. Every substation is different and would have to be scouted separately. And wouldn't such an army be keen not to give away its presence? And why, if a terrorist had dozens of trained and disciplined fighters to deploy inside the U.S., would their target be a utility substation? That's a very interesting column. Uh, I, I disagree with most everything that he says uh, in that column. I haven't read it, actually. But I'll tell you that this, number one, um, yes, there have been people who, you know, drunk hunters who've taken pot shots at substations, uh, you know, p people on a random basis who've gone out and, and shot at substations. No one, no one has ever planned and executed the level of a sophisticated organized attack that you saw on April 16th at Metcalf. That's undisputed. Number two, you don't need an army. You just need a very few number of people with some fairly unsophisticated weapons to target the most critical substations in this country, and there's not very many. And I'm not gonna reveal specific numbers because that would be 
revealing things that we shouldn't be talking about. But when I was at FERC, we did specific modeling on load flows to show that you can, in fact, take down the entire grid by hitting a very few number of these substations. So this gentleman who wrote this column has not done the analysis, has not done the studies, and really doesn't know uh, the details of, in fact, what could be done. Let's talk to Al in Waterton, Tennessee. Republican caller, you're on the air with John Wellinghoff. Go ahead. Taking my call. Uh, Mr. Wellinghoff, how do you know that those were AK-47s? Because we, we had the brass. It was a, a 7.62.39 cartridge. Yeah, I'm just letting you know that uh, for those of us uh, that, that know what we're talking about, a 7.62 by 39 could be fired by any number of weapons. Who do you work for now? You're billed here as the former chairman of the FERC, but are you not an energy um, attorney that is probably also registered as a lobbyist? Is that true? I'm not registered as a lobbyist. That's not true. Okay, so uh, who do you work for? Who I mean, do I work you're, for? You're, I, I'm you're a, billed I'm, now. Excuse me, excuse me, sir, if I can answer. I'm a partner in the law firm of Stoll Reeves in San Francisco, and I work on emerging energy technologies uh, at, the, at that firm. The co-chair of the Stoll Reeves Energy Team. So I, what I'm getting at is that your bill here as the former chair of the FERC is if you are coming to this from a, from a non-biased perspective, and you've already said things that were uh, demonstrably unprovable, primarily the AK-47, it's, it's uh, just important for people to know the context of uh, your presence there. And I okay. think it's good. Uh, thank you. Okay, Al, before you go, why, uh, you seem interested in this topic. Why is that? What do you do? Oh, we lost him. Uh, John Wellinghoff, do you, would your company benefit from any sort of reforms that were put into place to protecting the grid system? No, and I, I don't do work specifically in this area with respect to physical security. That's, that's not my client base. Why do you think he took issue with the evidence of the AK-47? Why is that important? I, I, I don't know. My understanding is that 762 by 39 uh, round is, in fact, uh, an AK-type round. Uh, I, I don't understand what the, what the point was there. It was a very specific round that actually had a low enough velocity to not penetrate the case of the transformer, but instead pe penetrate the cooling fins, which was their target. They specifically targeted the cooling fins. Okay. We're talking with John Wellinghoff. He is, uh, as we said, the former chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, he served from 2009 under the Bush administration, and then he became chairman in 2000, excuse me, uh, became chairman in 2009. He served before that under the Bush administration and then carried over into the Obama administration. Front page of the Wall Street Journal is our topic. Rebecca Smith had the story, a mystery assault on a power grid back in April of 2013 in California. Susan is in California, San Diego. Go ahead, Susan. Yes, good morning. Thank you for C-SPAN. Mr. Wellinghoff, I uh, am very interested in your conversation. I also saw you this week on uh, the PBS NewsHour talking about the same topic. And as a person who lives in San Diego and who was here when our grid went down uh, a couple of years ago, um, due to some kind of unexplained accident in Arizona apparently I just want to back up what you're saying about how uh, frustrating and disastrous this could be on on a longer term basis luckily the grid came back up in San Diego after four or five hours and everything was okay but had this gone on for any length of time it could have really been a problem and that's really all I had to say I just want to thank you for bringing this up and uh, focusing some attention on it. Okay, Susan. John Wellinghoff, go ahead. Well, thank you, Susan. And, and, and that is the point. I mean, the only outages that we've seen in this country have been of relatively short duration. The uh, outage that Susan talked about in San Diego was in a number of days. And then there was, of course, the, the big 2003 outage in the Northeast, which took out 50 million people for three or four days, uh, which was from simply a tree touch on a transmission line. So it shows you that that ultimately, you know, again, a, a coordinated attack by a very few number of individuals on uh, a number of substations could have a much more prolonged and devastating effect on this country. What were the uh, economic impacts of those outages? Oh, 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 
tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Certainly the, the 2000, I, I don't remember the specific figures on the 2008 outage, but I'm sure it was, was uh, beyond the tens of millions of dollars, probably in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Dwight in uh, Alaska, Republican caller. Go ahead, Dwight. Hi. Uh, uh, I think uh, you know, the whole issue of this thing with the, the power grid is being, uh, it's overlooking one of the more important aspects of it. I mean, sure, some you know, radicals or uh, you know, nutcases could go out with their weapons, but I think the, you know, the power grid could be hardened enough to where ordinary bullets aren't going to cause any problems with it. The more important issue is things like solar flares and, and uh, uh, outages that, uh, or the causing outages that could be not just you know, in America, could be in the whole of the planet. And right now, you know, uh, there's no uh, safety devices on our grid like, uh, you know, uh, uh, metal oxide varistors and things or high, uh, ultra capacitors that could protect our grid against power surges from the sun. And, uh, you know, I've written letters to the power companies uh, in various uh, times here, even in Juneau, because we're on an independent system and get no response from them. And that's, to me, a bigger issue. That our own son could knock us out quicker than any terrorist group or, or group of people with some rifles. And AK-47 rounds, those things are a totally impotent round. I mean, that couldn't penetrate the shell of one of the big transformers. There's no way. They might knock out some of the more minor, in, you know, smaller pieces of equipment and take the thing down for a short period of time. But, that isn't going to do it. And it would take an anti-tank gun to blow up one of the big transformers because the shell on those things is three, four inches thick, I think. Okay. Mr. Wellinghoff. You know, I, I really don't want to comment on what the gen gentleman said because I would be getting into details about the transformer case that probably shouldn't be disclosed. But, but ultimately, uh, he's right about the solar flare issue. Um, those are other... Um, vulnerabilities and those vulnerabilities actually FERC I know is looking into now and and looking at uh, you know promulgating or working with NERC and promulgating specific regulations to put in place uh, the type of equipment that the gentleman's talking about it's it's important to ensure that uh, from a major solar flare uh, or other type of, of, of uh, electromagnetic pulse uh, situation like that that we don't in fact ha have an outage and we, we, we do need to protect against that as well but I, I will say that he, he's wrong about the case of, of the transformer, and and uh, and you'd be very surprised as to what type of, of weapon, in fact, uh, uh, could uh, destroy one of those transformers. So it needs to be better protected. Absolutely, and and we certainly can do that. And there's multiple techniques uh, and uh, mitigation measures that we can take. I mean, the simplest one is every single one of these substations that have these high voltage transformers is surrounded by simply a chain link fence that anybody can see through at 1200 yards with a scope and a rifle. Uh, we could make them opaque so you can't see the individual targets within the substation. In addition to that we could put in uh, you know better cameras, better lighting as well. Uh, we could even put jersey barriers up which are fairly inexpensive with concrete movable barriers. Uh, that we've used overseas multiple times before uh, in front of these transformer uh, assets to ensure that the, uh, you know, some, some, some uh, bullet ballistic uh, uh, projectile could not, in fact, uh, uh, penetrate through them. So there's lots of easy ways, fairly inexpensive ways, to protect these systems. And they would be inexpensive. I mean, give us a cost to do this at every substation across the country. Well, we're not doing them at every substation across the country. That's f the first point we have to understand. There's 45,000 substations. There's only less than 100 that are the high-voltage critical substations that need to be protected. So number one, we're talking about a very limited number of substations. And number two, the costs, uh, you know, I don't have exact estimates, but you can imagine what it would cost to put an opaque fence around a, a perimeter that's maybe, you know, several hundred yards and uh, to put, you know, more sophisticated camera and lighting and, and even the concrete jersey barriers. I, I can't imagine it's more than, uh, you know, a, a million or a couple million dollars per substation. So spreading that over the cost of the entire uh, taxpayer base of the United States uh, you know, would be a very minimal amount of money to spend to ensure that we do not have a major outage that has consequences of, ex you know, extreme economic damage uh, and also potential, uh, you know, 
health and safety issues as well. All right, we're talking to uh, John Wellinghoff about a sniper attack on a substation in California back in April of 2013. Kevin, you're up next in, is it St. Louisville, Ohio, Democratic caller? Yes. Okay, go ahead. All right. Um, yes, sir. Um, I was just wondering, I am, I'm a union electrician, and I work at some of these sites. And the last few transformers we put in, real big transformers, they were made in India. And just to hear about the wait time on these huge critical pieces of equipment, it just boggles my mind that we don't have a stockpile of these in case such a thing would happen. Well, we don't have a stockpile. I mean, there are spares. There's no question that they have some spares. Interestingly enough, many of the utilities house their spares at the same substation. So, you know, you'd shoot out the, the operating ones. You could shoot out the spares at the same time. But um, the other issue is there is a very long lead time for these transformers, minimum of six months, and usually, you know, 12 to 18 months to make one of these transformers. There's only three companies in this country in the United States that make them, and yes, many of them are made overseas in Korea and India and other places. So, you know, the supply chain is a long and and very difficult one, and replacing these transformers would not be an easy thing if someone were to knock out a number of them, a large number of them, in a coordinated attack. How much do they cost, and what is their role? What do they do? Uh, each one of them costs tens of millions of dollars. And the role of these transformers is to step up voltage from a l number of generators that are in the area. So there, these substations are located where there are a number of large generating stations, and they st step up the voltage so that then the voltage can be, uh, the, uh, the electricity can then be transmitted on high voltage transmission lines to uh, the load centers, to our, our cities and towns where we need the power. So is that what a substation is then, basically? Yes, it's a node. It's a, it's a node on our grid that allows us to step up voltage of power and some instances step it down as well when we get closer to the loads. But these high voltage ones that I'm speaking of are primarily to step up that voltage so that ultimately it can be transmitted on these very high voltage transmission lines, the other, the 345 or the 500 or in some instances the 765 uh, kilovolt lines. What does the United States grid system look like? Well, it looks like three separate parts. There's three grids. There's a western grid, there is an eastern grid, and then there's Texas. Texas is not strongly interconnected into the rest of the United States. In fact, Texas is not under, uh, directly under the jurisdiction of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, for transmission with the, with the exception of reliability. Uh, FERC does have that responsibility. But these three, three grids uh, are, are separate. They, uh, they operate separately, ultimately. But once you're into that grid area, if you do something at one portion of the grid, for example, if there's an outage in Florida, it's actually felt in Maine. You can, you can, you can sense the frequency incursion uh, in Maine if, if there is a, a power plant, for example, that goes out in Florida. So because of that, because of this, this interconnectedness of this frequency across the entire interconnect, that's why taking out a number of nodes within the interconnect can destabilize the entire interconnect and bring it down. John Wellinghoff, here's a, a, a tweet from one of our viewers. Was the Super Bowl power outage a few years back an indication of potential problems? Well, that, that was a, a local, um, sub, um, a small uh, distribution substation transformer, it was my understanding. Uh, I don't think it was necessarily any indication of problems, certainly not, not any, any, any what near the magnitude of this, this uh, April 16th uh, purposeful attack. That was just a, um, you know, a, a, a random outage that, that was an equipment failure. I want to show our viewers a map of the uh, grid system in the United States. And then John Wellinghoff, another tweet from our viewer. Matt Smith says, looks to me like we're burying the lead here, that the national media sat on a major story for nearly a year. Well, it is interesting that, um, you know, it took Rebecca Smith uh, to dig this out. Um, you know, certainly, you know, I, I provided her some information, but she got a vast amount of information from multiple other sources and and really, uh, you know, fleshed out the, the entire story. It, it is, 
curious that no one else uh, picked up this story for such a such a long time. Is the FBI talking about it? I, I, I don't have any contact with the FBI. Should they be addressing it, though? You're addressing it publicly. Um, well, FBI, the FBI or, it, or some agency would be talking about it. I, I can't speak for the FBI, but it's my understanding that, that it is still under investigation. It's also my understanding that it's their policy not to talk about ongoing investigations. And, and Rebecca writes in her story, uh, Rebecca Smith writes in her story, that no one's been arrested. That's my understanding, yes. But again, you know, this particular investigation of who did this, you know, talking about burying the lead, is not the story, in my opinion. The story is, ultimately, that we need to protect these substations across the country and that we have it now known to us that there are individuals capable of carrying out these kinds of attacks. So because of that, ultimately, let's protect these things. Let's not see any future uh, attacks succeed to this level. And uh, another tweet from Rivera who says, attack on a power grid could have been by anyone angry at U.S. government for any injustice, such as the persecution of marijuana or something else. Andrew in uh, Port Mammoth, New Jersey, independent caller. Hi, Andrew. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, let's not forget the lessons learned from 9-11, even though it was only 10, 15 years ago. Okay, we have not learned anything. Uh, you've got the Immigration and Natural Aid uh, Immigration Service that is charged with keeping track of who comes into this country, where they are. And there was an Immigration Service out in California, the press reporter a few years ago, was backlogged, and they shredded the documents, which means no more paper trail. You don't know who these people are. Second of all, how easy it is to go and buy, buy a high-powered rifle at a gun show with no background checks, all you need the money to put down. They don't do any background checks at a gun show. The the gun laws in this country have so many hollow laws in them, you could drive a Mack truck through them. Okay. John Wellinghoff, I know you're not a gun expert, but uh, the first part of his comments. Uh, I, I'm not a gun expert, and I, I, I'm not, I, I would not advocate doing anything to... Uh, to uh, restrict our Second Amendment rights. I, I think, again, what we need to do is protect the facilities, which is a fairly easy and fairly inexpensive thing to do. Stella on Twitter, though, on that says, so we need more federal regulations, which means more bureaucracy, bigger government control of energy sources. Would that be the outcome? Well, I'm not su su suggesting that they control the energy sources. I'm simply suggesting that there be an agency who put together a coordinated plan, give that plan over to the owners of this infrastructure, and ensure that those owners carry it out. And then another tweet from J.D. Redding, what should be done to protect American infrastructure? Would wireless power transition transmission alleviate vulnerability? Well, one thing that would alleviate vulnerability if we all had our own power sources and certainly people are moving to that many people are starting to put in solar systems on their houses uh, put in uh, natural gas generators small co-generators uh, in their businesses as well and if if we go to a more distributed system uh, that obviously will be one that is much much less vulnerable to this type of a centralized attack on a system that is uh, vulnerable to that type of an attack. The call from uh, Alaska said that up there they're on some sort of independent system. What does that mean? Well, that's true. They're, they're, Alaska is on an independent grid as well. I mean, their, their grid would not be subject to going down if, for example, you took out the western grid in the United States. It would not affect Alaska because their grid is not interconnected with the grid in the United States. Why? I mean, sim Similarly, as Hawaii, well, because because Canada is between us and them ultimately, okay. but but that that and also be, because of, and and we are actually interconnected into the Canadian grid in part. In fact, if our grid went down, it, it could in fact affect the Canadian grid in part going down. But Alaska uh, parts are so so remote uh, that they their grid is an independent system from the rest. Just like Texas is an independent grid uh, from the rest of the United States as well. Kim in Santa Cruz, California, Republican caller. Uh, the question I have is, number one, if he's, if he's a Bush appointee, regulation really isn't one of Bush's big de deals. The other thing is, all I can hear is that he's saying he wants taxpayers to pay for the infrastructure upkeep. 
That's what I hear. Chairman Wellinghoff? Well, that's true. I, I think the taxpayers are the ones who should pay as, a, as opposed to the individual rate payers in each individual utility area that has these high voltage uh, transformer substations because protecting those is going to protect everybody throughout the country. So everybody's going to benefit, so everybody should pay. Dave in Orwell, Ohio, Democratic caller. Good morning, Gretchen. Good morning. I've got a few points. First, uh, when he blew off the caller a while back suggesting uh, that various weapons could shoot a 7.65 cartridge, uh, there's pistols that shoot 7.65s. So for him to think that they were all AK-47s is ludicrous. Second, uh, it was stupid to bury this story. Uh, everybody knows that when a crime is committed, You've got to take care of, you know, you have to bring it out. You have a short window that things can be um, taken care of or citizens or, you know, information can be gleaned. Uh, you bury it for a year and then bring it out. You know, it makes it look like it was some type of black op operation. Mr. Wellinghoff? Well, it was, it was a very sophisticated operation. In fact, the 762 round that they used... I believe was very carefully chosen for the job because they weren't targeting the cases. They were targeting the cooling fins, which were much, much thinner material. And so those bullets very easily penetrated the cooling fins, their targets. So they knew exactly what they were doing. Here's a, a tweet from one of our viewers off on the topic, but related to power outages. Can your guest explain the great New York City blackout that occurred years ago? Uh, I, uh, there was one in 2003 uh, that was that in fact blacked out New York City and most of the Northeast, and the explanation there was again a tree that you know was uh, in a storm touched on a line and caused uh, a fault on that line, and that fault then cascaded through Ohio and throughout the Northeast and ultimately brought down that whole sector of the country. Which makes my point that these interconnects are set up in such a way that one event in one area can have a devastating effect on a very large area very far away. What types of company, uh, companies or how many companies operate the nation's grid system? Oh, there are hundreds of companies that operate different parts of the grid system. Uh, different uh, parts of the transmission system in the grid. So there are multiple companies. There are large operators that are independent in some areas uh, called uh, independent system operators, regional transmission organizations. Uh, but other areas have uh, just private companies that uh, own the grid as well or, or in some instances public entities like uh, the TVA and Bonneville. It's, it's a mix. It's a huge mix across the country. That's why it should, that's, that, that also makes my point. That's why we should come back to it being a national problem organized at the national level because there are so many multiple different kinds of private and public companies who own and operate these assets. Freelancer on Twitter says terrorist attacks on power grids are a reason to keep some aspect of NSA surveillance program. She wants to know, are there any pictures or film of the attack at this substation in California in April of 2013? Yes, there are, there are uh, camera videos, very grainy camera videos that was in fact released by the Santa Clara Sheriff's Office, I believe in June or, or July uh, of, of last year. But they only show, again, uh, you know, very shadowy figures. You can see the muzzle flash from the AK-47s. Uh, you can see uh, flashes of it hitting the fence, the bullets hitting the fences. They're going through the fence. And, and, and I saw evidences of that, of that when I was there uh, touring the site. And you can also see uh, the flashlight very clearly uh, before uh, initially uh, signaling, commencing firing, and uh, also signaling to stop firing. During recent hearings, it came out that you, when you were FERC chairman, were, began an investigation into this, and you were also briefing members of Congress about what happened. Are members of Congress thinking about moving forward? Should they think about moving forward on some sort of legislation? We talked about this earlier, but then who gets the power to prevent something like 
this attack happening on a, on a larger scale? Well, I, I think Congress should consider uh, giving some agency the authority to address known threats and vulnerabilities, that this, in fact, is one of those in this instance, uh, which in also would include, you know, cybersecurity, things like St Stuxnet and other uh, cyber uh, viruses that, in fact, can uh, inf infiltrate the electric system and have devastating effects. So I, I think it's something that Congress uh, ultimately should consider because, again, as I've, I've stated, it is uh, a national problem. What about smart grids? What are they and what role could they play? Well, smart grids ultimately are uh, systems that embed intelligence into our existing grid and sensing equipment into our existing grid. Uh, we're putting on to the high voltage transmission system, for example, uh, what they call phase monitoring units that monitor every four seconds uh, the phases, uh, phase angles and uh, other data from the grid that can come back to grid operators and do things like help prevent the 2003 blackout by giving grid operators a quicker view of what's happening and then, you know, separate parts of it if possible uh, to ultimately uh, reduce the uh, possibility of these outages and improve the reliability. So smart grids can help these things. Uh, other things that can be done with respect to uh, grid configurations is to uh, put them into more regional and more uh, local microgrids with uh, DC uh, direct current uh, buses or switches in between them that can separate these grids if one part starts to go out, uh, separate it from the other part of the grid and it can be done with this smart grid technology. But that's very expensive to do. It's much more expensive than protecting these substations, but it would be another technique or another means by which you could reduce the impact uh, of an outage if someone went after one of these substations. Don Wellinghoff, the uh, former chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, served uh, as the chairman from 2009 to 2013. He was on the uh, panel uh, in 2006, put on there by George W. Bush, so served under two different administrations. We thank you, sir, for your time this morning, getting up early in San Francisco and talking to our viewers. Thank you, Greta. So that does it for today's Washington Journal. We'll be back tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Eastern Time. Thank you for calling in, sending us your tweets.